Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. I'm grateful for your prayers uh, because even before coming this week, I felt the spiritual warfare of bringing this message I'm bringing to you today. I was, uh, I'm being completely transparent with you and raw and real because I want you to know that you can know your pastor's heart. Um, I was tempted to not preach this message and the devil is slick because what he does, he goes, I think there's more important things you need to talk about right now. So don't do that one. And uh, I caught that and God, God really convicted me and said, I need people to get ready for my return. So you need to preach it. And this subject is, is challenging because it's so prevalent in our society. It's personal to our family and friends. It causes hostility and tension within circles, within uh, the church as well. Um, it's concerning because the devil is lying to people and people are going to hell and God is trying to stop that from happening. And so I'm going to be bringing up the subject and I'm gonna be taking at least two weeks, maybe three weeks, but starting today, I'm gonna do my best to squeeze in as much as I can with the time left. But I'm gonna be touching on the subject of the biblical worldview of homosexuality. This is uh, definitely something that we need to understand in a greater context of scripture too. I think a lot of Christians and non-Christians can get this wrong if we don't look at the greater context and the greater issue that has led to all sin, not just one sin. And Calvary never picks on one sin. What is God's view of homosexuality? What is the Bible's view? What should be the Christian church's view of homosexuality? Uh, Well, it's in scripture. And we're gonna be in Romans chapter one, verse 18. And we preach this message with humility and grace and love for all people, okay? For all things that people are going through, for all things that people are doing. And you're gonna see in the context of our scripture that there is more than just one lifestyle that is condemned in, in our word today. One thing you need to understand is Paul is preaching this word in the middle of telling the church, the Jews and the Gentiles, that the gospel has the power to save anyone and everyone if they were to believe. Before he goes into detail though of what the gospel is and what it can do, he tells us how severe God's judgment is on all sin, not just one sin. But in our text today, God gives a clear uh, a condemnation of homosexuality. And I did not warn parents, and I'm sorry, but I did not warn parents about this subject in advance, whether you want your child to be in the room or not. But I will say that uh, all types of sin are pervasive and pushing into your kids' lives. And so it's probably time to talk about them on certain, certain ages, you know what I'm saying? And especially you know, in middle school and up, Our kids need to understand these subjects, but if at any time you feel uncomfortable, you can walk out, that's fine. Romans uh, 1, 18 is is really where Paul is saying, before I get to the gospel, let me tell you how much you need the gospel. Before I get to the good news about Jesus Christ, let me give you a heads up of of how bad things are. And just so you know, Uh, homosexuality is in the greater context of a different issue, a bigger issue. And so is all sin. And that's what I'm gonna help show us today. Verse 18, but God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. This might sound familiar because we've covered this a couple weeks. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Paul is talking about a humanity before the gospel. He's talking about a humanity where it was even before the law, 
before the commandments, he's talking about creation was God's natural revelation to tell everyone that he exists, that he is there. And what he's telling us here is, is that wickedness suppressed that truth. And so therefore people rejected God. And because of this rejection of God, things go very bad in humanity. And that's really where he begins the text. Just so you know, mankind is not indicted on guilt here. They're not, they're not guilty because um, of, of God not revealing himself to them. They're guilty for denying his existence. That's what he's saying here. I have shown myself, I have been clear that I am here. You're denying me. And it's interesting because sin can cause things to be cloudy and questionable, can't they? What, what was always obvious and clear now becomes cloudy and questionable. And that goes for all sin, doesn't it? We begin to second guess what is truth, what is righteousness. That's what happens. And the reason why mankind is deserving of God's wrath and it's really bad is because they have rejected what is so obvious and clear right in front of them. And this is a spiral into greater sins. This is what happens next. Let's go to verse 21. <clears throat> yes, they knew God. This, is, this alone is, is not good. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. So early on in humanity, people knew God, but they wouldn't worship him. Now imagine the generations next who didn't worship God, their children now doesn't know God. Are you following me there? So now you have a godless nation of people or a godless group of people who their kids don't even know God exists, hence atheism or agnosticism. But these people are guilty of actually knowing that God is there but not worshiping him. Now what happens next in verse 22, or going on in verse 21. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. So here we have it. You deny God's revelation. You deny God and his knowledge. Now you're going to create your own knowledge, your own ways of thinking. And now you become lost in dark in human thinking. In other words, people, church, Everyone who's watching online, we need God's knowledge and revelation. On our own, we will become dark and confused. And the scripture says we become utter fools. Verse 23 says, and instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worship idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. Do you see that exchange, how bad that is? This beautiful God who created everything and created them, they've traded worshiping him for man-made idols or objects or things that can sit on a shelf. That's how lost and foolish humanity became in the beginning of all time. That's how foolish we became, is that we chose wooden objects that can sit on a shelf instead of worshiping the God of the universe. This is the result of rejecting God. That in itself is a sin. And it brings ramifications and consequences. And so he keeps going. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. What does that mean, abandon them? He gave them over. He didn't try to resist them anymore. He didn't try to put divine intervention along their path. He didn't try to stop them from doing what they're doing. He allowed them to go and do whatever they want to do. Because you know what? That's a God of love is that he wouldn't control you. He would let you operate in your free will. Instead of having puppets and controlling uh, you know, people to do what he wants, instead he allows us to have our own free will to do what pleases us, but obviously he doesn't like that and it hurts him. He'd rather have us be in relationship with him, love him, and do what he wants us to do. That's, that's what he really wants. So he abandons them. He's, I'm going to step out and not not try to stop them. I'm going to allow them to go and do what they want. As a result, it didn't get better, it got worse. They did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. 
They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Wow. They traded the truth about God for a lie. Our series is holding on to truth. People are holding on to lies instead of the truth. And we trade, we trade God for a lie in our society. And this is what humanity was doing. Instead of the God they knew was there that they should have worshiped, they chose not to, and they chose whatever lie they invented. And so they worshiped and served things God created instead of the creator himself. Let me uh, cover a couple things here real quick that I think are really important. What we see here is that humanity has this predisposition to worship something. We all worship something. The only choice we get is what we worship. Now, that's not mine. Another person said that. We all worship something. The only choice we get is what we worship. And whatever we behold, we become. So if they behold their idols or self, which is humanity's favorite God. I might have stepped on some toes there. I stepped on my own over the years. Selfishness is the worst God, false God in the world. What we're reading here is they chose whatever they wanted versus the obvious God in front of them. They chose to make their own gods and they chose to make themselves God. What do I mean? They began to worship created things rather than the creator. They began to worship themselves or worship other people. Do you see where we're going now? That when you reject God, you're lost and don't know what to do next. And then you begin to choose things that are not of God and you begin to worship uh, things that God's created rather than God himself. And it tends to be what you want or you'll even put someone above God. Now, the problem with this is in the Ten Commandments, so now let's fast forward. Before the Ten Commandments, this was humanity. It was lost and really bad. Now we have the Ten Commandments, and what does God establish in the first four commandments? How to love him. The last six commandments, how to love one another. And in the first commandment, God says, have no other gods before me. Interesting, isn't it? When you reject God, you make your own gods or you try to find something to worship because we all are going to worship something. It tends to be ourself if we don't worship God or it even tends to be other people or it tends to be a position or a, 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 um, a desire in life, a dream. We tend to worship it and we'll do everything we can to achieve it and then God is ignored. So there's this predisposition to do that and what happened is we started disobeying the first commandment. And then we disobeyed the second commandment. What is that one? Make no idols. Have no other idols. Have no idols. Make, don't fashion one. Don't create one. Don't make one in heaven or earth. Don't worship idols. So the first two commandments that we should follow first, humanity was messing that one up too. Man, we're a mess, aren't we? Now, here's the problem with that. If we can't get it right in the beginning, we're definitely not going to get the rest of the commandments right. If we can't know how to love God, we're probably not going to love mankind the way we're supposed to love one another. You know, Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the first commandment. The second commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. The first commandment comes first for a reason, because if we honor and worship and love God, everything else will fall into place. So what does Satan do? He gets us to worship ourselves in the garden by going after our own knowledge that, we, that God has protected us from. And he says, why don't you be your own God and get to know things that God knows? And so he entices Adam and Eve and they fall for it. And now we, we want to be God's we worship ourself and we put self before God. That's what's happening here. And because of that, things get worse. Are you, are you tracking me? You see, what I'm trying to get to is a rejection of God, a rejection of his will has caused us to do a lot of bad things. 
not just one sin. It's caused us to sin in all areas. And we're lost without God's will and knowledge in our lives. Without God, we're in trouble. So let's go on to the next verses, and this is where it gets pretty real. What is God's view of homosexuality? That is why, in verse 26, God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men, and as a result of this sin, they suffered within them themselves the penalty they deserved. Well, there you have it. Our scripture is clear that mankind, and this is what Paul's doing, Paul's using a very uh, severe example of one sin to show you how far off humanity got. The reason why I'm bringing this to you is because this reveals that this lifestyle has been born out of rejecting and abandoning God. It has not been born out of something good. Are you following me? It is to abandon God's natural design for mankind, for humanity. It is to essentially say that God didn't get it right. He got it wrong. Because he always intended that a relationship in marriage, sexual relationship in marriage is between a man and a woman. That is what he always intended. And he had good purposes for it. So here in this scripture, we see that God is talking about, Paul is talking about the wrath of God coming on sin. And here, Paul uses this as an illustration of a sin that also is, going, is condemned and will face God's wrath in the end. All right, now, the Bible condemns homosexual relations in other places in scripture such as Genesis 19, 1 through 13. And it wasn't just homosexuality there. Leviticus 18, 22, uh, Leviticus 20, 13, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 1 Timothy 1, 10. I want you to understand something, that homosexuality is never isolated or condemned alone. In each of these scriptures, the context is a rebuke of all types of wickedness, including sexual sin done by those who are heterosexual. So it's not, God's not picking on homosexuals. He never does that. And God forbid us doing that. We should never do that. He condemns a list of sins in all of these scriptures if you read the context. And then lastly, the Bible never affirms homosexual uh, relationships or marriage. Because a lot of people say, well, Jesus never talked about it. Well, he did. Jesus affirmed in Gen uh, Jesus affirmed in uh, Mark 10 and Matthew 19, quoting Genesis chapter two, that relationships that are of God are between a man and a woman. And especially sexual relationships are in the covenant of marriage, not outside of marriage. So people who are having sex with each other, not married, you're living in sin as well. Whether you're homosexual or heterosexual, that is sin. Uh, that's fornication. And then those who are married and then have sex with someone else that is not their spouse, that is adultery, that is also sin. And God says those people who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. They will not inherit heaven. So I'm stating this so you all know that God rebukes all sins, not just one group of people. But why? Because his wrath he already started it by allowing us to go down our dark paths instead of trying to fight us. <clears throat> instead of fighting us in humanity early on, he allows us to go down that path. Now, did God get involved? Yes. Praise the Lord. By his grace and mercy, he got involved. He gave us the commandments. He showed up to the Israelites through a cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. He was doing miracles like opening up the Red Sea. God showed up because he loves humanity. And through the people of Israel, he wanted all people to become saved through Jesus Christ in the future. This was pointing to the future. So 
I'm, I don't want to jump ahead here yet, but it, this is talking about before he did all that, this is how bad things were. Okay, so I just want you to understand that when we address this biblical worldview of homosexuality, we need to make sure we're careful that we don't just pick on that one sin. Now let's look at what happens next in verse 28. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. So again, it's not God's fault. It's mankind's fault for choosing what we want. We rejected what God wanted. We chose in our futile and foolish thinking to create whatever we want. We chose to worship ourselves, even worship other things that have been created instead of the creator. And so God is not gonna interfere with that because humanity was not listening. And so he goes on to say this in verse 29, their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. Wow. See, it wasn't just one sin. Mankind, we went off the rails without God's help. It's not good. He goes in to say this, they are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning and they disobey their parents. I feel like Paul put that in there for parents real quick. <laughs> we like to pull that one out, don't we parents? <laughs> but this one scares me. <clears throat> they refuse to understand. Why, why does that scare me? Well, read the context again. They knew God, but chose not to worship him. They knew they were wrong, but chose not to do what's right. They refused to understand what God really wanted because if they knew, they would have to stop doing what they were doing. Let me stay ignorant. Let me stay you know, clueless about that. I don't want to understand. I like what I got. And God wasn't interfering with that because he doesn't want to force you to believe in his word or believe in him. He wants you to come to him with a heart that says, you know what, God, you're right and I'm wrong. He wants you to see that. Now, it gets worse. You think, like, can it really get worse, Ryan? Yeah. They know God's justice. Same point I'm trying to make. They know this stuff. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die. In the end day, there will be judgment on all humanity. And those who have, who have trusted Christ and believed in him, eternal life. Those who haven't, eternal death in what we call hell. Separation from God. And it says this, yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. This is how bad it got. And Paul is getting our attention in this scripture before he gives the good news. Now, before he does that, it's not on the screen, but I want to read this to you. Uh, next chapter, verse, or chapter two, verse one. So he's talking to a group of people in the church, the Roman church, and he's writing to Gentiles and Jews. He's talking about a people of the past and now he brings it into their context, into their lives. And this is what he says. You may think you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad and you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself for you who judge others do these very same things. And we know that God in his justice will punish anyone who does such things. Since you judge others for doing these things, why do you think you can avoid God's judgment when you do the same things? Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Wow. So church, yes, uh, God does not celebrate, encourage any sin. 
not homosexual sin, not sin done between a heterosexual couple, uh, slander, gossip, uh, pride, pride and, and boastfulness and all these things. In other words, we're doomed, aren't we? Hey God, have you seen how much we do this? What are we supposed to do? Did God really abandon us completely? The answer is no. The good news, my friends, the good news is he gave us Jesus Christ to fix all of this. To fix all of this. Paul was looking back to show us how bad it was, but he wanted us to see how much we needed salvation in Christ. And he goes on to tell us that all have sinned. Church, we have been there, right? Before you believed in Jesus Christ, you were gone in sin too. You were wandering and lost as well, weren't you? But Christ came into your life and you believed what he did for you. John three sixteen. we all know it. Let's say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Praise God. God cancels, God cancels the penalty of sin with his righteous son, Jesus Christ. God's righteousness cancels the penalty of sin because we were so far gone, we couldn't save ourselves. This kindness is meant to lead us to repentance. And so sometimes out of God's love and kindness, he has to tell you how far gone you've gotten. He did to me. And I'm no better. I'm, I'm a heterosexual. It doesn't matter. Point is, if I sin, I'm just as guilty. And if I don't have Christ, I'm still guilty. But because I have Jesus Christ, I am forgiven. And you are forgiven. God, in this book of the Bible in Romans, he's calling out to the church. He's calling out to unbelievers. And he, you know, with the church, he's saying, understand your salvation. See what God has done for you. It's, don't trample on his grace. Appreciate it and walk the right way. Why am I bringing this up? Because it's not just the non-Christians who are getting swept into homosexuality. Now the world is influencing Christians who have loved God and have served God to say, maybe this isn't wrong after all. What did we just read? It's wrong. But it's a, a bigger issue. Humanity has rejected God. And because of that, now we're accepting everything wrong. It's not just that one sin, it's all other sins as well. Maybe today's scripture made you realize that you've gotten off track yourself. You don't deal with this particular sin, but you deal with other sins. What's the way back? Well, first of all, Jesus has made a way. I wrote this down in the first service. I was, we were in worship and I wrote this down on my notepad that there are people in this room today, whether it was first service or now in this service, Ryan, I can't change. I can't stop sinning. I'm so entangled in that sin or any sin. I don't know what to do. I, I know what to do. It's run to Jesus Christ Amen. because you're right. You can't stop sinning without him. And maybe the church has made him so approachable because we've been so hard on this one sin or certain sins that we think we can never be washed clean or forgiven. But the truth is you can. Run to Jesus. You can't do what's right and holy without the Holy Spirit in you. And I'm gonna talk more about that next week. We need the Holy Spirit to change our desires and our minds and renew them and live the Christian life. Here, here's what we tend to do. This will be on the screen for you. We tend to focus on the obvious sin, but miss the greatest issue of all, our lack of belief and worship of God. So as a Christian, if you're struggling with this lifestyle or any kind of sin, uh, what I would ask you is, are you worshiping God or are you worshiping yourself? Are you doing what God wants you to do? Or are you doing what you want to do? Why? What's the scripture basis for this? John 16, 9, the world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. 
That's a, that is the worst sin of all. Unbelief, refusing to believe in Christ, rejecting God. We need to get that right. Okay, because look what the next verse says. The next scripture says, they traded the truth about God for a lie, so they worshiped and served things God created instead of the creator himself. So when I help people struggling with homosexuality or any other kind of uh, sin or lifestyle, I don't go, let's get you to stop doing that. I don't do that. That's just like telling someone to change their clothes real quick. That's on the outside. What I do is I help them get to know God. Trust in Jesus Christ. Believe in what he has done for them. Let them see how, hey, this is what the Bible says about these things. Someone asked me in the first, after the first service, Ryan, what do you do? What do you do for like, to help someone who thinks, who believes they're a Christian, but practices this lifestyle? I, I don't focus on that lifestyle or that sin. I focus on whether they're worshiping God or not. Because obviously that's where we got it all wrong. When we reject God and his word, we're gonna start doing anything we want. Am I right or am I wrong? Wait a minute, Ryan. Aren't you supposed to call them to repentance? Aren't you know, turn away from their sins? Yes, but turn to what after that? Turn to God. Or turn to God and let him begin to convict and correct their hearts themselves. Let God work on them. I can't force anyone to follow Jesus. I can't persuade anyone. They need God's help to do it. Am I talking to someone today? You remember your salvation story? Amen. It, it's not Ryan's really good sermon. It's the gospel that has the power to save. Some of you are like, uh, you yeah, know, be careful, Ryan. Your sermon's not that great, you know. <laughs> You're right. For I am not ashamed of this good news. Romans 1, 16, 17. For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God at work saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile, because he's talking to them. This good news or the gospel tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith, by trusting in God and his word in Christ. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. So when I'm helping someone deal with any kind of struggle or sin, even myself, I go back to God. I go, God, where did I go wrong? Obviously, I have been... Uh, looking to my own desires and trying to satisfy my own desires, worshiping myself instead of worshiping you, God, and I'm sorry, I got it wrong. That's what I'm hoping to do with my friends. By the way, I have family members and I have friends who are homosexual. And I pray for them on a regular, how many, how many know what I'm talking about? And we pray for, on a regular basis. And I'm not just praying, I'm not, I, I don't think I've ever prayed for someone to stop doing that sin. I've always prayed that they would come back to God and love him and worship him again, or for the first time, so that his spirit will begin to do a lot of things, not just deal with that one sin, but deal with them all. And then not just deal with the sin, but make them a new creation in Christ so they can do new things for God. Because it's not just about getting rid of sin, it's about living out your real purpose in life. And we're not living it out if we're living in sin. Wow. That's the full gospel, a complete change. Now let me finish with this. Because he said this, Paul said this in the beginning, that they were without excuse because of the natural creation revelation of God. God in natural revelation. Okay, natural revelation being his creation. God is obvious, he's there, he's real. They were without excuse. What excuse do we have today? We don't just have creation, we have Jesus in the flesh walked on earth. Oh yeah, you're right, Ryan, you covered that in that sermon that Jesus existed, yep. That's why I had to do that. 
I had to make sure we believe that Jesus really did exist because it's God in the flesh. Jesus came to earth to help us get us out of our sin and escape God's wrath and judgment and go to heaven. And if that wasn't enough, he gave us his Holy Spirit to help us live a godly, holy life so you're not on your own. Even if there's no church around you, you could live a holy life because the Holy Spirit comes in you. And if that wasn't enough, he's given us his word, the Bible, the holy scriptures. And if that wasn't enough, he's given us the church that testifies, has testimonies of changed lives. Do you see that we are without excuse in our world for all sin, not just this one today? We are without excuse, my friends. God is calling out to us to come home, to love him again and to worship him again. because he loves us. And Calvary loves you. This church, we love you because God loved us. And we know that God has loved you. We speak the truth in love every time. We would never preach a message like this to make you feel like garbage. And we would never preach this message and not think of all the different avenues that might come into this situation. And so next week, I wanna cover some of that. Because it's more complicated than just, yeah, stop doing that, isn't it? There's more to it, isn't there? Like we learned today, there is more to it. I want you to know that Calvary, we believe in people coming to this church if they're dealing with or living in this lifestyle of homosexuality. We believe in it, especially if they don't know Christ, they need to know the truth. And we, we rather you come and be willing to let God speak to you and convict you and change your heart about this subject. I'd rather you be here than out there being torn apart by the devil and our culture who's saying, you're okay. Hell is not on the other end of this journey. That's not the truth, that's a lie. And that goes for everyone, not just someone dealing with homosexuality or in that lifestyle. I'm talking about every sin. I'd rather you be here, but please know this, that we are without excuse for all of our sin. God is asking us to change, to stop. And we can do that if we start worshiping him again. If we make him number one in our life, if we love him, we will begin to love everything he loves. Do you hear my heart of love here on this? Because I know I might get some emails on this one. But let's pray. Let me stand together. Maybe I won't get any emails. Who knows? Hey, the altars are open right now. Not just, I'm not, I'm not gonna hone in on one person or one situation. Anyone who needs to come before God and say, God, you've spoken to me today. I have been wrong. I have been off. I've been worshiped by myself instead of you. And God, I need you to, to guide and lead me into all truth. If that's you, you can come on down right now. No judgment in this place. We're not gonna try to guess what you're dealing with, what kind of sin you're going through or whatever you're, you're, you're struggling with. We're not gonna do that. We just care about you. And we wanna pray for you. So if you need to come down here, please do. Because only the power of Jesus Christ is gonna help you change today. And we're gonna have people come and pray for you if you're okay with that. And maybe you need to believe in Jesus Christ today as your Lord and Savior. Let's pray right now. Let's just begin to pray for people. Just like I said, I, I was dealing with spiritual warfare on this message. What if people are dealing with spiritual warfare right now? Believing that they will never be happy again because they give up this lifestyle or give up this sin. It's not true. God will give you fulfillment and satisfaction in him. I'm gonna be lonely the rest of my life. That's not true. God is gonna be there for you. He's gonna bring the church in your life and he even can bring someone in your life to be married to. Don't listen to any deception of the enemy. Trust God, give him your life. Ask him to change your heart your desires, your mind. Don't reject him, accept him.
God, we thank you that you've accepted us in spite of our sin. You kept helping us. Your word says, but God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God, your kindness is meant to lead us to repentance, lead us to coming back to you. God, we're sorry for our sin, all of us in this room, for anything we've done wrong, Lord. God, we're, we have Christians in this room, Lord, who, who are grateful for you and your grace, but we still feel that wandering or have wandered. God, bring us closer to you to live a holy life. Help us. For those, God, in this room who do not have a relationship with you at all, they, they would consider themselves not Christian at all. God, draw them to you right now to trust in you for salvation, Lord. Change their hearts and minds by your word, your spirit, in Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, for what you're doing online or in this room right now, Lord. We thank you, God, for saving, changing hearts and minds. From this point forward, lives will be different. They'll want to worship you instead of deny you. They'll want to worship you instead of live for self. I thank you, God, you're doing that today. God, we say this simple prayer. If, if you're someone who needs to to give your life to Jesus for the first time or rededicate, you can simply tell him, God, thank you for revealing yourself to me, for forgiving me of my sin. I am a sinner, but I believe that Jesus has saved me from the penalty of my sin, which is death. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your Holy Spirit to help me live a holy life. And I ask that you would help me to follow you. Renew me, renew my mind, cleanse it, make it brand new. Purify me. In Jesus' name, I pray. God, we thank you for this message. God, I pray we would let it sink in the way you meant for it to sink in. No matter what I have said or how I've said it, God, I pray that your spirit, Lord, would take this word and let it plant into our hearts and guide us and lead us into all truth and to you. We love you, God. We thank you for loving every single one of us and saving us. And we give you the glory and praise for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, church. Praise God.